Welcome to Voices of Experience. In the next half hour, we'll explore the future of Minnesota. What can we become? What will the future look like for ourselves, our children, our grandchildren, and even our great-grandchildren? I'm Dan Michael, President Emeritus to the Minnesota State Retiree Council, AFL-CIO, and I'm the host of today's program. Joining us today is Matt Intenza, founder of Minnesota 2020, and a tireless public servant. Uh, Matt and Tenza, welcome to Voices of Experience. It's a pleasure to be here with you. So, we have a lot of future ahead of us, so we should get started right, right, right with the questions right now. Uh, so, Matt and Tenza, you've served in the county attorney's office in, in, uh, over across the river at, uh, in Minneapolis and at Hennepin County, attorney general's office in the state of Minnesota. You're in the Minnesota legislature for six terms, uh, part of that time in, in, in leadership. You vied for the uh, uh, DFL for, for the uh, governor's, governor's yep. race, fell a little short on that. Yep. But you have a long career, and I'm, I'm looking at you, and, and you look very, very young to me. Well, you, <laughs> I'm going to bring you with me everywhere. Then. <laughs> okay. So what activities are you doing now, and how are they related to the uh, future of Minnesota? Well, I've had the pleasure uh, since the governor's race of doing some work with Governor Dayton on energy policy. Uh, but my passion is working with Minnesota 2020, which is a public policy think tank, mm -hmm. uh, headquartered in St. Paul, but with a statewide reach, and trying to think about what are the ways that we can work together in a positive way to make Minnesota a better place. Okay. Uh, state of Minnesota has been known as a great state, mm -hmm. and uh, I, I, can, I can recall specifically a cover of Time magazine mm -hmm. uh, with, with then Governor Wendell Anderson. Uh, catching a nice fish, walleye or, or northern, I don't remember which. Uh, and we were looked up to as a model. Uh, we, we need to get back to that. And what qualities do we, do we need, you know, does the state of Minnesota need now, in this day and age and in the future, to make, it, to make Minnesota, uh, again, a state that works and, and be a great state? Well, at, at Minnesota 2020, we think that Minnesota is one of the great states and that we became a great state because we invested in our people. We invested in education, and of course, you know, you know that as a teacher. We invested in economic development and helping to create businesses. We have more Fortune 500 companies almost than any other state of a similar size. In healthcare, and having high quality, low cost healthcare, and finally in our transportation uh, infrastructure, uh, which nowadays means things like light rail, but historically it meant roads. When we do things like that well, we do well as a state. We think at Minnesota 2020, part of our problem is that as a state, we're focusing on the distractions, the things that pull us apart as opposed to the things that pull us together and that make the state a great place. So we, we are not looking at, uh, at, at the last quarter's business profits. We're trying to look further ahead than that. Uh, That's right. I, we call it Minnesota 2020 because it's to look clearly, 2020 vision, uh, but also Minnesota 2020 because where should we be going over the next eight years? What should Minnesota be looking for, looking over the horizon? So, for example, uh, we spend a lot of time uh, fighting about issues that pull people apart that at the end of the day, people can certainly have legitimate differences of opinion about, but the things that should bring us together, we all want our kids and our grandkids to have good schools. We need to have good roads and good transportation. We need to help uh, to create jobs and to have a strong program for economic development and, of course, good schools. If we don't have those things as a state, we can't survive and do well. And that's what our grandparents and our great-grandparents put together. They gave us a legacy of a state that focused on those things, and we need to give that to our grandkids and our great-grandkids. Okay. Is Minnesota 2020 uh, a nonpartisan group that focuses on issues, or is it a group that focuses on, on candidates? Well, Minnesota 2020 is a nonpartisan group, and it doesn't endorse candidates, it doesn't lobby, it focuses on issues. You know, too much of politics today is a politics of personal destruction. It's uh, people saying, you know, I think that, you know, you're a horrible person, or I think this woman is a horrible person, and tearing people apart and tearing them down. Minnesota 2020 is, we're, we believe in coming together and focusing on what are the policies that bring folks together. So, for example, one of the uh, first things that we looked at is how come half of our school teachers quit in the first five years? Mm 
-hmm. And it, partly it's because the pay is not competitive with the private sector. And partly it's because teaching's tough. I mean, 30 <laughs> kids, 40 kids in a classroom. I, I mean, I personally can't imagine that. It was hard enough for me to raise three kids. And so what are the strategies that we can have to help support those teachers? And that was one of the first reports that we put out looking at demonstrated strategies, proven that work, and that had nothing to do with being a Republican or a Democrat and everything to do mm -hmm. with how do we build a state that's gonna be successful for everybody. So in legal terms, you're a 501c3? That's right, we're a 501c3. So people can find our website at mn2020, uh, mn2020.org, mm -hmm. and what they'll find every day are new discussions in a positive and not a super heavy sort of way, but of what we can do as a state to build things together, and then increasingly, uh, lots of video, and mm -hmm. where we bring people together, and you mm -hmm. can see video of people having discussions, but the goal is always the same, how to build up the state, how to make Minnesota more interesting and vibrant place that people will want to live, and most importantly for me, now that my kids are grown, that my kids will want to live here, and my grandkids will want to live here too. Very good. So let's, let's look at some issues. Uh, energy, yeah. uh, you, you uh, mentioned in your, in your opening com uh, comments, and. Uh, in your high school years, you were down in Worthington, Minnesota, uh, down in the southwestern part of the state. I think of the Buffalo Ridge. Uh, and I, I, th I think of Jim Nichols, uh, a great passionate spokesperson on behalf of wind energy. Uh, how is Minnesota 2020 uh, involved in the entire scope uh, of uh, issues we get rega regarding energy? Well, look at it this way. Every time uh, you turn on a light in your house, money is flowing out of our state because we spend $10 billion on electricity and that flows to other places. Coal in North Dakota, natural gas in Louisiana, oil from Saudi Arabia. And we believe at Minnesota 2020 that we should be spending our resources on building up Minnesota's economy. And having grown up in uh, southwest Minnesota where, boy, there's a lot of wind, as you know. <laughs> there's a, no shortage of wind down there blowing all the time. You know, the wind is free, and no one's going to be able to start charging us for wind, and we should pay ourselves for our energy. And every wind turbine, every single wind turbine we build in a place like southwest Minnesota makes as much money as an oil well does in Texas. Mm -hmm. So it only makes sense. We should pay ourselves for our energy. We should keep that $10 billion here at least as much as we can. And on top of that, not only are we helping to build our economy, but we're helping our environment because, of course, as we burn fossil fuels, that has other costs that uh, hurts our lungs, puts mercury into our lakes, which makes fishing uh, a problem. And you know what? Most importantly, it keeps money in the pockets of us here in Minnesota. So let's keep our economy going here. And so at Minnesota 2020, we're about self-sufficiency, Minnesota economic uh, growth, and saying let's make Minnesota help itself first, which means let's spend money on ourselves rather than shipping it off to somebody else. What, what is the status of nuclear uh power in, in Minnesota? Well, we've got two nuclear power plants in Minnesota. We've got mm -hmm. the one down at Red Wing, another one up at Monticello. Uh, nuclear power uh, is something that it can be helpful for the environment in the sense that it doesn't have carbon that comes off of it. Um, it has complications because the waste, of course, is highly radioactive and it's a little unclear what we're going to do with that. So it comprises about 20% of our electricity. That's going to stay the same for the time being. But for right now, none of our utility companies, given the cost of building a new nuclear power plant, are talking about building one. So I would say in terms of where we're going to go with power, it's much more likely to be uh, wind and solar in some of those areas because those are a lot cheaper to produce. Mm -hmm. And for the time being, they're pretty economic compared to something like nuclear. But nuclear is part of our base energy and it's going to continue to be part of our base and energy. And that provides about 20%? It's yeah. about 20%, yeah. Kind of, kind of uh, reminds me of property taxes, yeah. which is my least favorite type of tax, <laughs> but it, it does provide a, a, a stable part of the mix for, 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 for the total tax picture. Yeah, when you look at energy, you want to have, um, you want to not be over-reliant on any one sort. You know, wind no. power is great because once you pay the cost of that turbine, the wind is free. But obviously some days are windy and some days aren't. Yeah. Solar power is great, but obviously you can't get solar power at night. And so you need that balance. And so other parts of our energy sector provide the balance. At Minnesota 2020, though, we think that we've been over-reliant on fossil fuels that come from other places in that, uh, for example, coal being the dirtiest. Now, I don't know about you, but growing up, uh, I went fishing every weekend as a kid. Now on most Minnesota lakes, there's warnings that you can't eat more than a couple of fish a week because of mercury. 
Now that mercury didn't get there by accident. It wasn't because people broke a thermometer and dumped mercury no. in the lake. That comes from coal that's burned in Montana and Wyoming and North Dakota, Minnesota. And after it's burned, it comes up into the air and then it comes back down again um, as uh, ash, but a little bit of it is mercury and that gets in our fish in our lakes. Mm -hmm. So we'd like to see less coal because it's not a Minnesota resource. It's hurting things like fishing. Uh, it causes more asthma for our kids and grandkids. And something like wind or solar, um, you know, they don't have those sorts of, uh, of things that are going to hurt us. Okay, let's let's switch to a, to another issue: uh, housing yeah. and uh, f foreclosures. Uh, for for too long now, uh, you know, our, our local papers have been filled with uh, with with the official uh, foreclosure notices, and, and even people who have houses paid for are are affected by by foreclosures. So. So here we are in mid-2012. Uh, what's happening to the foreclosure rates in Minnesota? And is there any kind of uh, pattern to, to what's happening now? No question, you know, the 2008 recession is four years old, but it hasn't ended. And so even if your house is paid for, at some point when you think, well, I might want to sell this home, uh, maybe, you know, downsize and move to something else. If you've got two foreclosed properties you know, anywhere near you, that's going to depress prices and make it harder for you to sell your house at least for as much as you want. So it's a real problem. Um, at Minnesota 2020, we have argued that the bank should be required to work more with folks who are underwater. And what underwater means is people who refinance their homes, the values dropped so that now the value of their home is below the value of their mortgage. Mm -hmm. And the reality is, the, a lot of banks haven't been willing to negotiate with folks to help them out because the, the banks made a mistake at the same time that uh, people made a mistake. And if people can't move, if they can't refinance, if they don't have the opportunities to sell their homes, it's going to continue to perpetually depress uh, the values of homes around the Twin Cities. And we think that uh, banks, as they help people with their workout, both in foreclosures and in refinancing, should have to negotiate more because otherwise they just force people into foreclosure and that's bad for our economy, it's bad for everybody and those costs ripple out much more broadly. So is, is the foreclosure rate getting any better? Uh, well, we're finally seeing um, home purchases uh, begin to pick up a little bit. It looks mm -hmm. like prices have kind of bottomed out. Um, but there's still a fair number of houses that are sort of sitting out there yeah. because people's values are underwater that are in danger of foreclosure. Okay. Until we really see the economy start to pick up, that's going to be a real problem. That's why we think that the, the banks uh, with government regulators working as a, a part of it should have to do more of these workouts to help people so that they can refinance. Until people can refinance their homes, it's pretty hard to get the market going again. Okay. So taxes, yeah. uh, always a controversial issue. Uh, in Minnesota, the income tax is regressive. Mm -hmm. That is, uh, people uh, with lower income mm -hmm. are paying a higher percentage than people who have a higher income. Uh, and there have been calls to have a more equitable tax uh, system. And then the, the hue and cry from the other side is that that's class warfare. Uh, is, is it class warfare to call for a more equ equ equitable uh, tax system? Absolutely not. You know, one of the shocking things that's happened in the last 20 years is twofold. First of all, middle class families have seen their earning power go down. Yeah. And, and as a result, you know, people who are working harder than they ever have before are making less money. And uh, that's uh, in part because wages uh, have gone down. It's because health care has gotten more expensive. At the same time, the wealthier have never been wealthier, um, and more and more money going to a very few folks. So if there's class warfare going on, I would say that it's you have more and more extremes of wealth, and what we need is not government forcing a lot of redistribution, but we need, do need more fairness, and tax policy is one of the ways of doing that. You have to have taxes, because if you don't have taxes, you can't have schools, right. you can't have roads. So when someone says, well, I don't want to pay taxes, well, nobody wants to pay taxes. But on the other hand, everyone want, needs to get up in the morning and know that their water's clean, the police will come if you call them, the fire department will be there if you need them, and that you can get to work on good roads, and that, once you, and that the traffic lights will work. So we're going to have to pay some taxes. And then the next question is, what's the fairest way to pay taxes? And at Minnesota 2020, we believe that should be on the basis of the ability to pay. Mm -hmm. 
So if you're very wealthy, you obviously can afford to pay a lot more than someone who's barely struggling along. And you're absolutely right. What's happened over the